Great, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's one Mocha of those, Java. right? I mean, yeah. give me a break. <laughs> started today we're going to kind of break in with the journey of coffee for each of us it's it's a special journey it could be as simple as how you brew it whether it's as a french press or at your local coffee house and really to understand that you first have to know a little bit more about what goes into that cup it's an honest exchange it's a pure one with a tremendous amount of history it's farmed between the tropic of cancer and the tropic of capricorn and the equator so for us we want people to really appreciate what it takes to produce this product globally at high elevation to become an arabica bean that defines the specialty coffee market just breaking it down to its most fundamental level Customers want good drinks. They want quality in the cup. We talk all day about all the nuances and great, and great potential in the bean, but it starts with the bartending. It starts with knowing what you're serving. And whether it's a good liqueur or a good cocktail or a good coffee, it's really about mixing. It's about how skilled are you with your ingredients. So before we even dive into this, we got to go back to our roots, you know, as bartenders, coffee bartenders. And I mean, all three of us can speak to the fact that it doesn't take long when you're mixing drinks to find out how certain coffees do well as an espresso or do well as a French press. For me, that was kind of the drive into discovering so much more about all the unique, you know, origin coffees. You kind of need to see the map to understand that coffee began in Ethiopia, what we know today is Ethiopia. It kind of began there, it grows wild there, it grows, it still grows wild there. So for hundreds of years, the Ottoman Empire protected coffee, used it only for purposes of war or religion or ceremony. They recognized that it was a very special product. Of course, over time, as imperialist nations kind of made their way through this part of the world to discover spices and other wealths, uh, they stumbled upon coffee and coffee began its journey out of Africa into the Indonesian islands. The Dutch are very responsible for bringing it here. The English brought it into India. Um, the French and the Spanish brought it, you know, they spread it throughout Africa as well, but they brought it over to the New World and brought it over primarily to Central America and South America. Um, and that's sort of where coffee, but it all started here, got on ships and made its way around the world. So a lot of people today think that coffee is native to Mexico or native to Colombia or native to Indonesia, but it actually isn't. It was moved there and planted there uh, hundreds of years ago. So our general regions of coffee are the Indonesian Spice Islands, Africa, and then Central and South America. And each country within those regions is very unique in the way that the coffee tastes, in the way that it can be blended or added to other coffees. So the first discovery for us, our first journey for us, was to sort of <laughs> sample every coffee from every nation. I mean, really was where you start. Again, there's this, this separation. You know, you have this European experience, which the European experience goes back to the 17th century when they discovered coffee uh, in, you know, really from the Turks. Yeah. And, and so like the European experience is so further along as far as product than the American experience. But then we hit that fast forward button and then really with Starbucks and some of the commercial companies here, where in the 1980s, 1990s, suddenly they took this experience, which was really exclusive. It was off the map in the US and they hit it big and they went across the country with it. And so again, you know, we were, we were really drawn into this. And when we talked about this early on, Carm, when we started uh, with our first coffee cart, Oh, yeah. You have to admit, I mean, the international experience is what drew me in. Well, it, it's, it's what we can relate to, right? We lived it, we traveled as kids abroad from Indonesia to all parts of the world, really. As, as young people, we were exposed to so much. And when you look at, at that journey, we, we understood it firsthand because we lived it. I look at it today and it's like 2020. Too, and, and there's still so many places, even in our country, which is kind of the leader in the world, that still don't have great coffee. And that's because, again, the farming of it is one element of it, but understanding the nuances of how to roast it and actually bring out the best in that bean or blend it is even more challenging because now you're taking and creating your signature on this industry, and, and that defines you as a person and what you believe to be great flavor, and there's no hiding that. Well, really, when we go back in, you know, a couple hundred years ago, um, as the Dutch are developing coffee in Indonesia, primarily on the island of Java, they would bring this coffee. They needed to get it to Europe and get it up into Holland, of course. There was no Suez Canal at the time. 
So coffee would come out of Indonesia and begin its journey across Central Asia into Africa. It would make stops all along the way and the ship would take on cargo and freight to bring to Europe. Well, the coffee from Java, they would stop in the port of Mocha, which is in modern day Yemen. And the coffees of, of North Africa and the Middle East would make their way out of the mountains into the port of Mocha, where they could be sold and distributed. So the Dutch would mix the Javanese coffee with the coffee from the port of Mocha and then begin their long journey around the Cape Horn of Africa up into Europe. And this would take months to, to journey. Coffee is like a sponge, it, it absorbs things. So the coffee itself was in wooden ships. It would, over the journey of that voyage, it would take on the flavor of the ship. It would become woodsy and it would taste like the salt air of the ocean. Uh, they were blending beans as well from Java and from the port of Mocha, and this became known as Mocha Java. And coffees from this part of the world, primarily North Africa, your Ethiopian coffees, your Yemenese coffees, have a very berry-like quality, in some cases almost like a blueberry quality if they're roasted properly. Along with the coffees from Indonesia, which are very earthy and have a spiciness to them. So when you blended these coffees, you created a spicy blueberry floral coffee with a woodsy flavor of the ship and some salt, <laughs> salt air to boot. So they had a very unique product for quite a long time in, in Europe. It was aging, right? Yeah, it was aging in the ships. Yeah. And of course, as, as, as modern times as we move into the 20th century and container ships become available and, and the Suez Canal is finally built and the voyage from Asia into Europe is much quicker, that kind of ended. Well, you know? keep in mind, they didn't know they were aging the coffee. No, they just, that's okay, all they, they could do. Again, yeah. you know, it, it's, oh yeah, wow, that's great, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's more of those, Java. right? I mean, yeah, give me yeah. a break. <laughs> And, and to this day, you know, Java is still the vernacular for coffee. I mean, we think of it as the word for coffee because it left that kind of imprint, especially in Europe, the Javanese coffee blended with the mocha coffee it just created a very unique product. Today, about the only thing similar to that in India, they do what's known as monsoon malabar. Uh, they, they harvest their coffee, they put it into buildings that are made of wood. They allow the salt air of the, the humidity of the monsoon season, uh, season the coffee over time. And, and when you get it, it's an amazing coffee from Mon the monsoon malabar out of India. It's like a red hue to it, it's spicy, it's very, very unique. I personally enjoy it a lot. It already has, it embodies a lot of those characteristics just from where it's at. So yes. It didn't have to go through that journey to to accomplish yeah. that but when it you look at that way and then it gets even more so. oh for sure you, you look at the map and you see how many countries really are involved with coffee and yet it's it's a product we consume all over the planet right it's it's the second most traded commodity behind oil as we see today with what's going on in europe you know and the uncertainty with with all of that coffee has survived so many <clears throat> moments in history and its journey is spectacular really when you think about it how it wakes the world up every day yeah. and how we take it for granted that it's going to be there every day. And, you know, to me, that is the part of it that I look forward to every day when I get up is that first cup, whether it's at home or here in our coffee shops or even when we travel. It's a very personal relationship that really comes to define your, your whole day, how it starts and ends, really yeah. starts there.